We've talked before about microaggressions, but never like this. As you might be aware, or maybe not, microaggressions are subtle verbal or nonverbal insults. These may be committed consciously or not toward a member of a marginalized group. For example, locking your car door just before someone different walked by, that would be a microaggression, right? So commonly, microaggressions are discussed in relation to race and ethnicity. But did you know, this is really only one kind of microaggressions to be watching out for. So today we're going to expand our conversation to another kind, those related to disability. Hello there, this is Bradley and you're listening to Psych Everywhere. This episode is brought to you by a special psych partnership with CSPP Alliant International University. If you'd like to learn about graduate programs at CSPP, be sure to check out the link in the show notes for this episode. To guide me in talking about disability microaggressions today, our guest speaker is Dr. Rhoda Olkin from CSPP Alliant International University. So my goal today is to get some information from Dr. Olkin in order to help listeners like you be more comfortable and informed when speaking with people with disabilities. And, you know, hopefully these conversations are going to make it more comfortable for people with disabilities, too. Um, so Dr. Rhoda Olkin has written the book on this topic, literally, and actually two books, as a matter of fact. So one is three books. Okay, so one is Disability Affirmative Therapy, a case formulation template for clients with disabilities. Another is what psychotherapists should know about disability. And the third is... The new one that's coming out this July is called Teaching Disability, and it's for teachers of diversity classes who want to have a portion on disability and really don't know that much about it. And so it's 36 activities that you can do either as homework or in class with your students to help them learn about disability. Awesome. One of the problems with uh, some of the ways that have been taught about disability is that the long-term effects is they actually have increased pity mm. or and although in the short term, they seem to increase empathy, in the long term, people start thinking about, oh, it's so hard to have a disability. These people must be so courageous, so brave, so superhuman. Um, and so it backfires in terms of the message. So I was trying to think of activities that didn't focus so much on the disability within the person, but that mismatch between the person and the environment so what are the burdens placed on people with disabilities? What are the things they have to do that other people don't have to do, like calling everywhere before you go to see if it's accessible? That was just one example. And so it focuses a little bit more on the psychosocial political aspects than it does on what it's like internally to be disabled. So that's book three. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. I'm looking forward to that one. So a little bit more about Dr. Olkin, and then I'll officially uh, inter uh, welcome her to the show, but I'm glad that she went ahead and let me know that. Dr. Olkin received her PhD and master's at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and her bachelor's degree at Stanford University. Dr. Olkin has been at CSPP for almost 30 years, and she frequently speaks and consults on disability issues in clinical and work environments, and now on the Psych Everywhere podcast. In particular for this episode, we're going to focus on a 2019 article that she first authored in the Journal of Social Issues. So that one is called The Experiences of Microaggressions Against Women with Visible and Invisible Disabilities. Sort of a, a basic overview of that article is that it's a mixed method study on microaggressions experienced by women with visible and invisible disabilities. Amazingly, when that one was published, there were only, is this right, only two prior studies that actually examine microaggressions yes. experienced with people with disabilities? Wow. So hopefully, another goal for today is that this talk is going to inspire more researchers to want to focus on this topic. Anyway, that being said, I'll let Dr. Olkin tell you more about the study as we go along. Dr. Olkin, welcome to Psych Everywhere. Thank you. It's nice to be here. 
I went ahead and shared four or five questions with you beforehand, but then I'm sure I'll have some more too as we go along the way. And I also have four example scenarios um, that I kind of found off of Google or wherever that um, hopefully we can talk about to sort of avoid and correct some of the microaggressions that happen out there. That sounds so great. I think that's going to be really interesting. So I hope everybody will stick along for that too, where we sort of apply what we've been talking about. All right, I'll just jump into question number one, which is what have you found are some of the most common and bothersome of disability microaggressions? So there are two things that we might ask about any given microaggression. One is how often does this happen to you or microaggressions like this? And the other question is when this does happen, how bothersome is it? And both are important questions because sometimes a microaggression might be very infrequent, but be very, very bothersome. And in contrast, it might be both very frequent and very bothersome. Um, so one of the things we found is that there were two microaggressions that were both very frequent and very bothersome. So one was someone downplays the effects of disability on your life. So they just don't quite get it, how pervasive it is that you have a disability and it affects every single sphere of your life from economic to housing, to social interactions, to intimacy, to sexuality, to parenting, just everywhere in your life. And I'm gonna give one small example mm -hmm. of how disability affects things that somebody might never think about. I had polio when I was one and my feet are now two different sizes. Mm. My right foot is a child size and my left foot is an adult size. I spend my life looking for socks, mm. socks that match in both a child size and an adult size. So this is simply a task I have to do because of my disability that no one else thinks about, oh, how hard is it for you to find socks? Okay, but that's not, that's about a societal thing, a sort of systemic thing. What we're talking about now is more the interpersonal thing. So when someone downplays the effects of disability on your life, it's this kind of thing that I'm talking about, the finding of socks, the having to call every restaurant before you go to find out if they're accessible. It's the myriad things that are hidden from others. And so what we found was this was the most frequent microaggression as well as the second most bothersome microaggression. In addition, the fourth most frequent was your right to equality is denied. And that was the most bothersome. One of the interesting findings is that who does the microaggressions makes a difference. When they came from family members or another person with a disability, they were particularly bothersome and hurtful. So if, for example, you're a 30-year-old woman, you've had a spinal cord injury, you're thinking of getting pregnant, and your mother says, I don't think you can handle it, dear, that's going to have an impact that's different than a stranger or even a doctor saying that to you. Um, people recounted somebody on the bus who also had a disability making a comment to them that was very hurtful. So certain kinds of microaggressions linger differently than other kinds. Your right to equality is denied is something that happens out in the world pretty much multiple times a day. Um, a UPS truck parks in front of the only ramp. Somebody without a handicap sticker takes the handicap parking spot. Somebody comes up to you and says, what did you do to yourself? I've had a friend asked, do you have sex? Just blatant blurting it out. Um, so these things happen very, very frequently. And the question is, what's the impact of them? So if women with disabilities are encountering frequent microaggressions that are also very bothersome, 
what's the impact this might have on them? So we look at the literature on microaggressions on other groups of minorities who have not studied disability yet, but we have to assume that the effects are gonna be fairly similar. And they take a toll on both physical health and mental health. It's anxiety producing to never know when you're gonna encounter a microaggression. Mm -hmm. And it's depressing when they do happen. So we would expect both physiological health effects of long-term microaggressions as well as psychological effects. Wow, so your, your 2019 study, it also found two new forms of microaggressions, which I thought was really interesting. Could you elaborate on those as well? Yes, now we found two, that, and remember there were only two studies that had been done prior to this 2019 study. So one of them was on 257 people with a wide variety of disabilities, both male and female. And the other was a small study on 12 males and females with disabilities. We wanted to see if microaggressions are gendered, that is the intersectionality of both disability and being female. And we found two microaggressions that had not been talked about before, but bear in mind that we did not have a control group of men with disabilities, so we can't say for sure that these only happen to women with disabilities, but they were new to the literature. The first one was something along the lines of, you're too pretty to have a disability. Something about the way the person looked and attractiveness seemed counter to the idea that they had a disability. It's hard to even explain because it doesn't make any sense, but we heard that a lot from various women with disabilities. And the second one was being disbelieved about their symptoms. And I think there's two things at play here. One is studies in medicine do show that women have a harder time being taken seriously when they report symptoms. The other is that women are more likely to have autoimmune disorders than men are. And autoimmune disorders are notoriously difficult to diagnose. They have fairly vague symptoms that could be caused by a number of things. But we found that there was a very long lag time between the time a woman reported her symptoms and the time of diagnosis, in part because she got told it was stress. And so the symptoms were not taken as indicative of a physiological disorder. Well, we've only covered the surface of this, really. But just based on what you found just, just there, these I think we talked about four in particular microaggressions. What research do you think is needed next like so that we can figure out what to do with this and how to improve this? Well, I think there's a lot of open areas because mm -hmm. this is so yeah. new. Since this article was published, I have reviewed a few articles that will soon be in journals, maybe two or three that are about microaggressions. One of the trends seems to be looking at microaggressions towards very specific disabilities, such as visual impairments and blindness. And I think that is a worthy area of exploration because while there are commonalities across disabilities, there are also things that are very different for certain disabilities. So that would be one area. The other would be we do need to study the long-term effects of disabilities. Even though we know what they are for other types of minorities, we haven't proven this for people with disabilities. A third area is intersectionality. So I very distinctly remember in one of the focus groups I was doing that there was an African-American woman and she was describing a microaggression that happened to her. And she said, and I know it was because I was disabled, not because I'm black. And I had a protocol I had to follow, so I couldn't answer, ask follow-up <laughs> questions. But I really wanted to know, how did she know that? What happens when your multiple identities intersect and you encounter a microaggression? How do you cognitively think about that in terms of your intersecting identities? And 
what is the meaning? And then of course, the logical extension of that is how do people cope with microaggressions? One of the things I see in my clients is that when they become aware of the concept of microaggressions, which is very well known in psychology, but not so much to your average client, they start to notice each and every one. And then what happens is you realize if you don't ignore some of them, you're not gonna get through life very well. You simply have to ignore some number of them to just exist. And then how do you prioritize which ones need your attention and what you might do about it? So I think all of these are very fruitful areas for further research. I'm thinking that already in this conversation, and we're really just in the beginning, you've probably inspired some people listening to want to get involved in this. So say there was an undergraduate student, what advice would you have for them to get involved in research like this? Well, obviously, I'm going to plug my program for several reasons. (laughs) One is the PsyD program in Emeryville at CSPP has graduated more students with disabilities than any other program in the country in clinical and counseling psychology. So we have some expertise in really developing accommodations at the graduate school level for people with various disabilities. Secondly, we're very lucky to have in our Emeryville campus two faculty who specialize in disability, myself and Megan Carlos, and that's highly unusual. One is unusual, two Mm -hmm. is very unusual. And third, this research that we've been talking about was funded by the American Psychological Association. And I was able to partially support the three students who worked with me on this research. Next year, I have ongoing research that I'm going to be doing about the experience of graduate students with disabilities and what they would like their instructors to know that would help them pedagogically. And I'm already working with a student on that. We're gonna interview 187 students with disabilities at all of our campuses. And so I would be very eager for more students to join in that project. So there's a lot of ongoing work that students could become involved with. So what are some microaggressions that women with visible disabilities faced in your article, but not those with invisible or the other way around? When people had visible disabilities, the number of comments from strangers is very noticeable. I know this in my own life, just going to the grocery store, going about my day, somebody's going to make some kind of comment. When I use my wheelchair, the comments are things like, you're going to get a speeding ticket, or you drive that so well, or don't run me over. And I just mostly ignore those because they happen so often. Um, And we had a woman who was a little person in one of the groups. And she said every week, at least one person, stranger, comes up to her and picks her up. Imagine how (laughs) intrusive that must be. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It sounds unbelievable. But this is her experience, which I well believe. So visible disabilities incur a lot of comments. The people with um, invisible disabilities had a completely different set of problems. Some of them would deliberately take a cane with them so that when they parked in handicapped parking, nobody yelled at them. Mm. Um, If they needed a seat on the bus, they often were not believed that they needed the handicapped seat or they were told to get out of the handicapped seat they were more likely to get that comment, you look too good to have a disability. Mm -hmm. So hidden disabilities can be very hard for other people to really understand how they affect you. Why would a hidden disability, for example, lead to needing handicap parking? Well, if you think of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or any heart conditions or diabetes one, these are all things that can have mobility limitations, but that wouldn't be visible to somebody else. And so being believed and getting the accommodations were a big issue for those people. 
And why exactly uh, did you specifically focus on women? Um, is there less research for women? There is, in general, less research Mm -hmm. on women with disabilities than men with disabilities. Margaret Nosek is one of the primary research, uh, now deceased, unfortunately, but she has done a lot of research on women with disabilities. But I think that where the field needs to go is to stop thinking about disability as the only attribute of the person, Mm -hmm. as if they have no other characteristics, and that we have to start thinking about disability in context. And both women and people with disabilities are considered minorities. And so we were interested in the intersectionality of these two minority statuses. It would have been lovely to have a comparison group of men with disabilities, but that Mm -hmm. was really beyond our scope. But in general, I think the direction of disability research has to really start thinking about the context. There are lots of studies that report the demographics of the participants, but they don't do any analysis breaking out those different demographics. And I think we need to start fine tuning our research Mm -hmm. more. Since this is Pride Month, um, are there unique microaggressions for like LGBTQI people who might also have a disability? Because you mentioned already race. Well, I don't, claim to have expertise in this, but I did do a study with a colleague on gay men with disabilities, Mm -hmm. where we interviewed 10 men with disabilities in the gay community. And a few of them were blind and they reported something I hadn't thought about in a heterosexual context, which was a lot of getting together for two gay men has to do with visualization, looking at somebody, making eye contact, et cetera. Mm -hmm. When you're blind and you can't do that, what they found is somebody would come up and touch them, which they found intrusive. So this whole nonverbal array of signaling, they couldn't participate in, and then they were not comfortable with the alternative. The other thing we found is a fairly high rate of sexual abuse as youngsters. By the way, we also found a really high rate of that in the study on women and microaggressions. But we found that for the men. Disturbingly to me, the men did not report them as traumas, but as somewhat welcome advances and early sexual experiences, even if they were, say, seven, eight, nine years old, they thought about them very differently than the way the women talk about them. That was interesting. The other thing is because we had a wide range of people over different age groups, the effect of laws on the everyday lives of people with disabilities was really highlighted So where children were sent to school, whether they were segregated, like particularly the blind men uh, being segregated in special schools. Mm -hmm. But I think a commonality we found is that when they came out as gay, the mothers in particular would say something along the lines of, Oy, you have a disability and now this, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, it's like too much, <laughs> uh, two minorities. How are you going to mm-hmm. survive? How are you going to get through this? But the mothers for the most part did come to some level of acceptance and the fathers had a much, much harder time with it. I think that's probably true even without the disability. So you've mentioned pity and like people assuming that someone isn't really disabled. What are some other like common misconceptions about disabilities? Probably the most common misperception is that it's awful. It's mm-hmm. a tragedy. It, although I've said it does affect every single aspect of your life, it's really not the most important thing about me in many ways. If you ask me about my identity, I would say first, I'm a mother, I'm a woman, I'm Jewish. All of these things are sort of top of my list. But the the onlookers, the outsiders think 
it just must consume me and that it's a tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing they assume is that the modal response to getting a disability is depression. When in fact, only about 30% of the people who incur a disability do get a clinical depression. That means 70% do not. So it's not the modal response to disability. The other misconception is that people with disabilities are asexual and sex and disability is so rarely talked about. So this is a big thing that I want clinicians to really understand that if they don't ask about sex with their clients with disabilities, they become another person who's not talking mm. about it. So what are some things that people can do to improve perceptions of disabilities? How do we change attitudes towards disability yeah. is a huge question that's gotten a lot of research without a lot of forward movement. Mm -hmm. um, what we know changes attitudes the most is having a peer at the same power level as you and working together and knowing someone with fairly close contact. That's the most important thing. And that's been through years and years of study. I've become less interested in attitudes towards disability than in behavior towards disability. And how do we change behavior? So for the woman, the little person who got picked up, I don't care what people think, I want them to stop picking her up. Yeah. <laughs> I want people to stop parking illegally in handicapped parking spots. Now, it may seem that in order to do that, we have to change attitudes, but I don't think so. I was looking at the results of a poll that talked about how Americans feel about gender marriage equity. Mm -hmm. The law changed first and then attitudes changed. We've seen that over and over again. Law has to be out ahead of attitudes and then the attitudes catch up. So I would like more laws for protection of people with disabilities and then attitudes to catch up. Attitudes towards disability, both implicit and explicit attitudes have not changed one iota. They're still overwhelmingly negative. So how did you become like interested in this research personally? Or if that's too personal, we can skip that. That's okay. I think like a lot of people you know, I started to study my own issues. Um, I had, you know, I, I had polio when I was one. So it's been lifelong for me. And I've really had a lot of time to think about what has been the effect? How do I get treated? What are other people's reactions? And then I did my dissertation on that. And then I left it for a while so that I wasn't the disabled researcher. But I came back to it because my feeling, honestly, is if people with disabilities don't do this, who will? Rehab psych is somewhat peopled by straight white males to an amazing effect. This is the only minority group where you're not expected to be a member of that group, to be a researcher or a clinician with expertise in that. Every other minority group you're part of that minority, but that's not true for disability. Disability experts are, are not necessarily people within the community. And so that's been one of my driving forces is I'm an insider. I bring different assumptions and perspectives to the research and to the clinical field. And so my overriding goal is how can I train more clinicians to work with clients with disabilities in a way that's more disability affirmative because if 50% of all families in America have at least one member with a disability, virtually every clinician is gonna see people with a chronic illness or disability. So I would like them better trained. So are you ready to do these four example scenarios? I would love to. Okay, I, I, I think this should be interesting. I looked all over Google and looked for, you know, in forums where people said, oh my God, I did this, I shouldn't have, what do I do? 
And I, you know, and then a whole bunch of people would comment all these answers, you know, you need to correct it, you need to avoid the problem, you need to da 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 da. And I thought, let's take these problems, let's bring them to someone who's an expert in this. So the first one that I, that I came across, someone said, you know, my company goes on this annual hike and now they have an employee who's in a wheelchair and they're wondering like, what should we do? Should we approach this person and invite them anyway? Should we try to like talk to the whole company wide and change the event around so that it would be more accessible? Like, what do you think? That's a great example. So there are many, many trails that are wheelchair accessible and Mm -hmm. there are maps put out of how to find them. The state Mm -hmm. of California, for example, has such a map. And I would ask the person arranging the hike to be the one to have to do the research. It's not fair to make the employee do that. None of the other employees have to do that. So if they do a little research, they can find a wheelchair accessible hike. And then there's no issue. When they invite the employees, they simply make a note, this is a wheelchair accessible hike. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And here's another one I came across. And actually, when I read it, I thought, yeah, I've, I've experienced this. I've done this myself. I was listening to someone, they were talking to me, and I didn't quite understand what they were saying. And I'm pretty sure I did the wrong thing, right? I let them keep going, thinking I'll avoid any discomfort. I'll figure out what they're saying. And, you know, a couple minutes goes by, and then I had to stop them and, and say it. And then at that point, it was awkward and say, I, I'm, I need you to go back a good bit here. So what should a person do when you're not understanding someone? This is a somewhat common thing for people who have any kind of speech impairment along with their disability. And for some of those people, it actually is hard for them to talk and they don't want to be talking unless they're being understood. So it is okay to say, I'm having trouble understanding you. Would you mind slowing down? Is it okay if I interrupt you, if I miss something? to have a conversation about the process, to together decide how should we handle this? Mm -hmm. So it's not their problem, but it's our problem. And then sometimes if you miss a word, you might have them spell the word or use a different word. What you don't wanna do is finish their sentence for them, but do let them talk. Here's an example where the person said the wrong thing. They accidentally said, see you later to a blind person. And then there's that awkward pause or whatever, um, where I guess they were both realizing what he, what he had said. So should this person like go back and address this or move on? Like, how do you handle when you put your foot in your mouth? Things like Actually, that. Actually, there was nothing wrong with that. You can say, mm-hmm. see you later to a blind person. It's a common expression. <laughs> And the avoidance of the expression is probably going to be more noticeable than just saying it. Mm. One of my favorite cartoons is a person in a wheelchair around an elevator and everyone else in the elevator is looking up at the ceiling going, don't stare, don't stare, don't stare. (laughs) And by not staring, they're being obvious and they're not staring. And I think what you're bringing up is a similar example. There's nothing wrong with saying, see you later to a blind person. Okay. And so let's say you want to praise someone with a disability for their hard work. How do you do that without making them feel sort of othered? Because I know that's a common thing. Yeah, good question. So would you praise someone without a disability for doing that same thing? If not, are you really just praising them because you don't expect a person with a disability to be able to do that? Or because it's part of that myth that people with disabilities are such overcomers, they're so courageous, they're so brave, they're so super, then that's why you're praising them. So think about whether you would praise someone else for the same thing. Like if I do a good job at work, I do want to hear about it, not because I'm a disabled employee, but because anyone doing that would have been praised for that good work. Mm -hmm. So you really have to think about it. You know, it's not, oh my God, I can't believe you get up every day and make breakfast. That must be so hard for you. No, you don't generally praise people for getting up every day and making breakfast. Now, if I made breakfast, though, you should definitely praise me. (laughs) (laughs) 
Me too. <laughs> I'm a non cook. Uh, I didn't. You mean I didn't buy it or something? <laughs> So I, I wanted to end this on a positive note because I realized as I was writing these questions, like I'm pointing out all these potential problems and that's not, you know, that's not how I want to do this. I, I want to make sure that we shine a positive light as well. So could you share, do, do you have a mentor or, or just someone who really inspires you with a disability? I do think this is one of the problems for kids and, and young adults and graduate students with disabilities is there aren't a lot of mentors, which is one of the mm -hmm. unique things about our program is you do get a mentor with a disability. But growing up, I had polio just before the vaccine. That meant that I had older people who had had polio. There was a very, very large epidemic in 1952. So I knew older adults with disabilities and they were married and they had kids and they had jobs. And just seeing that was really important as a young kid. The other thing is FDR. Mm -hmm. You know, people with disabilities can be president. That's a pretty powerful model. And, you know, I, I think other minorities would say the same thing. Having someone in the White House is a pretty powerful mm -hmm. statement in and of itself. Now, he did go to great lengths to hide his disability from the public, Nonetheless, we all know he had mm -hmm. polio. And then there were the people in the early disability rights movement, many of whom I met and who went on to be leaders in the field. People like Ed Roberts, a name that's extremely well known in the disability community, but not as well known outside of it. He was the first quadriplegic to sue to be able to go to college at UC Berkeley. And then he sued them again because they housed him in student health. So he sued to be able to live in the dorm. So it's not only that I knew some people personally, mm -hmm. but that there were public figures. And these were important because they were disability rights advocates. Mm -hmm. And they changed laws. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for agreeing to speak with me today and inspire everyone. I know you have. And I just want to thank you for all the work that you do that hasn't been done that should have been done a long time ago, really. Well, this thank is, you. It was a pleasure. Yeah, this has been a wonderful interview. I, I kind of knew this one was going to be. I wanted to really jump in and do this one as quick as I could. <laughs> Great. You've just listened to Psych Everywhere. This episode was brought to you through a Psychi sponsorship with the Alliant International University, California School of Professional Psychology, that's CSPP. Founded in 1969, CSPP was one of the nation's first independent schools of professional psychology. Today, CSPP continues its commitment to preparing the next generation of mental health professionals and advocates. Their dedication to ensuring every community's access to quality mental health care extends from integrated care to inclusive family therapy. Explore their programs at https colon forward slash forward slash discover.alliant.edu forward slash psychi forward slash home. You can also find this link in the show notes for this episode. As always, I encourage you to subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already done so. Leave a five-star review at Apple Podcast. You'll make my day, and more importantly, be playing an important part in helping us get psych everywhere. And feel free to follow us on Twitter too, at Psychi Podcast. Would you like more diversity-related educational content? Of course you would. Go check out www.psychi.org forward slash diversity. There, you'll find tons of content about social justice, inclusion, race and ethnicity, gender identity, sexual identity, first generation and non-traditional students, take a breath there, refugee and immigrant status, social class, and yes, physical and other disabilities too. Psychi magazine articles, journal articles, podcast episodes, webinars, blog posts, 
all of it's in one convenient location for you to look through. Okay, I think that's all for now. I'll talk to you again soon. Copyright 2021, Psychi the International Honor Society in Psychology. All rights reserved.